Come in. Um, sorry, the sales interview is actually the one down the hall a little bit, two doors down on the left. Hi, sorry, no, my name is Kyle. I'm here for the full stack developer interview. Oh, well, nice to meet you, Kyle. I mean, you are dressed a little bit nice, though, for a developer interview. You know, normally developers don't dress very nicely. Well, you know, I just wanted to, you know, dress nice, give off a good first impression. You know, they always say dress to impress, so I figured why not. Interesting. Isn't this office a little bit sterile? I mean, there's nothing even on the walls. I'm sorry, but I don't remember asking you any questions about my office. Remember, I'm interviewing you. M my bad, my bad. I'm sorry. Continue, continue. Now, I took a look at your resume earlier this morning, and it looks really impressive. I mean, you have tons of personal projects. You have a lot of experience with JavaScript, Node.js, and tons of CSS experience. But one problem that I noticed is it looks like you only have about six months of Dino experience, and we are really looking for a candidate that has about eight to 10 years of Dino experience. Well, Dino hasn't even been out that long. I mean, nevertheless, though, we can ignore that. As long as you do well on our interview questions, I can overlook this slight failure. Failure? Whatever. Okay, so here is the first question for you. In JavaScript, what is the difference between let and const? Oh, well, that's a fairly easy one. I mean, when you define a variable with const, you can't redefine it. And with let, you can redefine the variable. Oh, nice job. That's, that's a really good answer. So moving on to the second question, what would you do if you wanted to reverse an array in JavaScript? Uh, th this is another actually fairly easy one. There's a method dot reverse in JavaScript. You could just call array dot reverse and it'll reverse the array for you. Good job, that's also a correct answer. Now we're gonna move on to some more hands-on experience. We're gonna do some uh, whiteboard problem solving. Really, whiteboard interviews? Come on, me and you both know that this is not something I'm gonna do on the day-to-day. -day. My skills of writing down code on a whiteboard have nothing to do with my ability to actually program real-world applications, which is what you're trying to hire me for. You know what? You're, you're right, this, this really isn't something that you're gonna do day-to-day, -day, so we shouldn't actually test on this. So instead, I'm going to just move on to our final question. As long as you can get this right, I'm pretty sure that we're 100% going to hire you. That is actually the source code for one of our applications. And right now there's a bug in it that's causing some of our user data to get corrupted, most likely from a race condition. And your goal for this interview question is to solve that bug, figure out what it is, and completely get rid of it. And this is actually a timed exercise. And your time started as soon as I handed you the code, which means that you're actually four seconds past the maximum time limit. So I'm really sorry to say, but I don't think this job is going to be the right fit for you. What do you mean? What are you, what are you talking about? I, this is just blank pieces of paper, random, what? Interesting that you think that way. Are you, are you kidding me? Screw this, I'm out of here. Have you ever had an awesome idea for a project, and as soon as you try to go buy a domain name for it, you realize literally every single good domain name is taken? Well, luckily for you, .tech Domains, today's video sponsor, has got you covered because they have tons of available domain names that are short and memorable, which is exactly what you need in a domain name, and they also end in .tech, and it really gives you extra authority in that technology space. I mean, tons of people are using .tech domains. CES, for example, switched over to using .tech. West Boss has a uses.tech domain name, and .tech is just all over the place. I even got the domain name battleship.tech, which I could have never gotten if I was trying to do a .com or .org. So if you're looking to get a domain name, use go.tech slash WDS linked in the description, and then use the code WDS.tech and you're gonna get 80% off of a one-year or a five-year domain name, which is just incredibly cheap. So I highly recommend you go check that out now. Welcome back to Web Dev Simplified. My name's Kyle, and my job is to simplify the web for you so you can start building your dream project sooner. So if that sounds interesting, make sure you subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. Or if you really want, just subscribe because that intro took me way too long to make and I had to essentially completely trash my office in order to get the camera angles that I needed. As you can already tell by the skit at the beginning of this video, I'm going to be talking all about technical interviews, why they're broken, and how we can actually fix them. And this is a topic that I'm sure a lot of you can agree with. I mean, how many times do you go to a technical interview, they pull out this huge whiteboard and they're like, okay, show me how to create a linked list, you know, on a whiteboard. And it's like, what? When am I ever going to create a linked list in coding? And let alone, when am I ever going to need to write it down on a whiteboard? I mean, if you're anything like me, your handwriting probably sucks because all you do is type anyway, so it's hard enough just being able to write, 
with legible handwriting, let alone actually create a linked list without any compiler checks, without any debugging tools, just having to do it by hand. I mean, that's impossible. Nobody does that. But why is it that every coding interview you go to has some type of problem like this? Whether it's on a whiteboard, whether it's questions asked back and forth, or whether you're lucky enough to actually be able to use a computer with a you know, development environment that you can set up to solve these problems. Why is it that they even ask them though? Because like I said, you never use linked list or you never need to figure out the time complexity of bubble sort when you're doing normal coding practices, but you're probably gonna get asked it in an interview at some point. The reason for all this is because it's really hard to test the actual skills that you need to use as a developer. Some of the biggest skills that you're going to need as a developer are you're gonna need really, really strong problem solving skills. You're gonna to need to be able to act on your own. So if you get stuck at a problem, you need to be able to find a way to get to the solution yourself. And then if that fails, you need to have good communication skills to be able to talk with your team members, talk with people that are higher up or lower down than you, and try to figure out solutions to problems, either helping them or having other people help you. So having those different types of skills are really crucial to software development. But it's hard to test someone's problem solving ability and their ability to get themselves unstuck. I mean, that's just not something that you can really easily test without throwing problems at them. And unfortunately, since interviews aren't days and days and months long, I mean, nobody wants to go through a month long interview, they have to give you problems that are short and quick, such as, you know, bubble sort or a linked list or these different algorithm based questions. And they're not really necessarily indicative of what you're going to do in a day to day job just because they're so short. I mean, most programs you write take days, weeks, months, years to complete. So having to, you know, figure out if you can do that in a single interview where all you have is just, you know, 10, 20, 30 minutes, maybe even an hour to solve problems, you really can't figure out those one to one mapping. You have to choose these smaller, more algorithm based problems. The problem, though, with these types of short, quick algorithm based questions is that they very heavily favor people with a computer science background. Even if a job says there's no education requirement, People with a computer science background are already one step ahead because they learned algorithms and different things like linked list and merge sort and heap sort and all that stuff. They learned it all in school already. While if you're self-taught or going the boot camp route, you're not gonna spend time learning these things. I mean, they're useless pieces of information. You're never gonna need to know what bubble sort is because you're never gonna use it. You just don't need to learn these things. So you're gonna skip it because why would you waste your precious time learning these things you don't need to know? And you know, it makes sense. But these are the things that they're gonna ask you in interviews. So everyone that has that computer science background where they were forced to learn these different topics is gonna to be a step up in this process because they're gonna know the answers already without having to do any studying beforehand. This problem is even worse when you go to larger companies such as you know Facebook or Amazon, Google, Netflix, these massive companies, because they have a much more solid process that you have to go through with interviewing because they get so many applicants. So you're going to be bombarded with tons and tons of really, you know, detailed algorithm based questions that you never would ever run into. And you're going to get these really tough, really, you know, contrived examples of problems that you need to solve in a short period of time. And unless you spend hours and hours studying and grinding through leak code to be able to solve these problems, you're not going to hold the torch to the people that, you know, do that kind of work beforehand to figure out the solution. So really, what they're optimizing for is a bit incorrect. They're optimizing for the person that spends those extra hours learning these useless skills just so that they can pass an interview test. I mean, I know for a fact that I am terrible at those different things. I would never be able to pass any of those different types of interview problems, but I feel like I would still be a good candidate for you know one of these companies just because I feel like I have enough experience as a web developer to be able to figure things out without needing to know all of these different weird contrived you know algorithms and data structures that I just don't know about because I don't need them. So how do we solve this problem? How do we get rid of these terrible short you know algorithm based questions and replace them with something that actually tests the knowledge that you're going to use in the real world while you're programming? Well, one thing that a lot of companies may do is instead of giving you these algorithm based questions, they're going to give you like a take home assignment or they're going to give you some kind of larger coding assignment that you do on your own time over maybe the course of a week. And it's estimated to take you maybe between like one to 10 hours, depending on how involved this you know, problem is going to be. But generally, if I was gonna give one of these, you know, you want it to be on the short end, you know, something that'll take like one to two hours maximum. Because people, you know, they're interviewing for a lot of jobs. They don't have hundreds of hours just sitting around to do random to-do list applications all the time. So it's important if you give out one of these different types of problems, 
make it small enough that it's really just testing to make sure the person actually knows what the heck they're talking about. If you give them a basic problem, just like create a Node.js application for maybe a complex to-do list, and it's just you know fairly simple that anybody that knows Node would be able to do pretty easily, it's kind of like you know a first level of screening, essentially like they seem like a decent candidate, give them this problem just to make sure that they actually know what they're talking about. And they didn't just lie and say they have 500 years of Node.js experience because you know why not, how are they gonna prove it? Now this isn't a terrible idea because it does give you that first level of screening, but it's really flawed. I mean, first of all, who wants to really spend two hours outside of an interview doing these types of coding problems for every company you apply for? It doesn't sound very fun. I mean, how many to-do lists can you create before you just want to, you know, stop and just give up? And secondly, it's really easy to cheat on these types of things. And I don't really want to say cheat in like the typical sense, but cheat as in like watch a full tutorial on how to do it or just take someone else's source code for how to do this problem. Because generally these smaller types of problems are the perfect types of problems for tutorial videos or blog articles. So it's really easy to just copy someone else's code, paste it in there, change it a little bit, and there you go, you solve the problem. And it's going to look like you're really professional and you know what you're talking about, even if you know nothing at all about it. Now, I think it's perfectly okay if you use something like Google or another tool to be able to help you solve the problem. But when you just go ahead and follow a tutorial step by step to solve these types of problems, the company's not really getting any valid information. So really all they're doing is wasting your time, they're wasting their time, and it's a terrible idea overall. So we know that short questions are a bad idea. And take home assignments can be good, but generally aren't very good. So where are we left with solutions? One thing that you can do is try to just ask questions in the interview that aren't like super hardcore technical. They're more questions about like, what would you do in this type of scenario? So for example, given that you need to take certain inputs from you know the client side and you need to take those into the back end and you need to store them in the database, like how would you go about structuring that data flow from client side all the way to the database and like how would you structure your tables how would you structure the back end how would you structure the front end but not in like technical hard code terms we're talking just general explain it to me kind of things so instead of saying oh you know i would write this function that did this and i would write this function that did this you would say oh i would you know create a database that has you know these three different tables with fields for the user based on what we're passing up and on the client i would have some kind of form you know that i push up and that kind of stuff you're not writing the code you're not even saying the code you're just giving general ideas of what would you do in this situation because that is what you do as a developer someone gives you a task and says i want you to do x y and z and then it's going to you know have a b and c as side effects and you go okay now you have to think about how you're going to solve that and you solve it and you think about it and you write up the code and there you go so if you ask people questions you essentially give them a task and say how would you start this task what would you do where's your thought process at you can really dive in and see how they are at solving problems because you have to go through that mental thought process of can they actually solve this problem can they take the mental leaps that they need to get to the solution that you expect or at least a similar solution now this so far is the best option that we have because it's going to be testing their problem solving skills without having to worry about their you know minute details of coding languages or algorithms but it still could run into some problems in that people may know in general how to solve a problem but not actually know how to write code in the language or framework that you're using so while this is great for helping test people's problem solving skills it's not necessarily perfect at figuring out exactly what people know about a particular language or a framework and that's where this kind of fourth idea comes in, where you can give them coding challenges or coding problems that aren't like algorithm or data structure based, but it's like features of the language that you're trying to use or features of the framework that you're using. And a lot of times companies take this too far. They get really contrived with things that you're never going to see in real life. And they're like, OK, if we do this with X and then these 500 lines of code, now what is X at the bottom? It's like, I don't know. I don't care. No one does this. But what you need to do with these types of questions if you're constructing an interview is to make them simple yet still difficult. So if you want to just test if someone generally knows JavaScript, you know, ask them questions about let versus const. Ask them questions about closures. Ask them questions about these kinds of things, you know, promises. Things that you run into as a JavaScript developer that if you didn't do JavaScript, you wouldn't know. But as long as you've worked with JavaScript enough, you're going to understand how it works. Don't ask them crazy details about, you know, super minute details of JavaScript language that nobody ever uses. Just ask them practical real world questions about the language to make sure they even know what they're talking about. 
Now those last two that we talked about with the general types of questions of problem solving as well as like language specific questions, those I think are the best ways to interview a candidate because they really help dive into you know exactly how they problem solve and if they know the language you're talking about. But the best thing that you can do as an interviewee, a person being interviewed, is have some form of project or portfolio that you can show to these people that are interviewing you. Because if you just have a portfolio of projects available, say, hey, I've built all of these cool things and they're awesome, go check them out. That immediately shows the interviewer that you know what you're talking about, you know how to do what you need to do, and you know how to build real world projects. That's all they care about. So if you can show them that, a lot of these other things don't matter as much. Even if you aren't able to ace the crazy stupid algorithm problems they throw at you, as long as you have a solid portfolio, that's going to put you a huge step above and they may be able to overlook any failures that you have with algorithm problems or other things because all they really care about is that you can build a real world project and actually implement the skills that you need for their job. So with that said, thank you very much for watching this video and make sure to check out my other discussion based videos. I'll have them linked over here and subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. Thank you very much for watching and have a good day.